Are you saved? It's kind of the, the question, isn't it? Are you saved? Well, we don't know. We don't know yet. We hope we're saved. But is there a difference between salvation and redemption? Because you'll hear an awful lot of people speak about uh, that this act of Jesus on the cross clears me of everything I need to worry about. Uh, no, it opens the door for you to be cleared, but it does not clear you. This is the act of redemption. It is not the act of salvation. This is a uh, aspect of uh, theology that many people outside, almost everybody outside the Catholic Church mistakes or gets wrong, and many people inside the church get wrong as well. Our blessed Lord came to earth. He did not say anywhere along the way, when I do this, you're all saved. That isn't scriptural. As a matter of fact, it's anti-scriptural. It's not a question of something being, uh, back up a moment. It is, when we look at the Bible and we look at scripture, some things, some of our beliefs are scriptural. Some of them are simply non-scriptural. And then other things, which are not Catholic beliefs, are anti-scriptural or anti-biblical. So it's not just a question about, is it in the Bible or is it not? There are lots of things that all Christians believe, Catholics and Protestants, uh, that aren't in the Bible. For example, the apostolic age comes to an end with the death of the last apostle. Virtually every Christian worth his weight in salt believes that. If it doesn't come to an end there, where does it come to an end? But it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible the apostolic age ends as soon as John writes his last sentence and puts a period there and drops over dead. Now, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Yet we believe that. All Christians believe that. That's the point. At the end of the apostolic age, there is no more revelation. There's no more public revelation. So something can be non-biblical and yet still be a central holding of someone who says that they're a follower of Jesus Christ. When the Bible was written or when, it, when the various books of the Bible were being composed. Uh, the, what they captured, both in the Old Testament from the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish experience of, of Revelation and the New Testament experience, uh, was part of the oral tradition of what both the Jews and the uh, later Christians came to believe. Part of the tradition was written down. That we call scripture. But that is not all of the tradition. As a matter of fact, it's not most of the tradition. Who interprets what happens here? It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible who does the interpretation. The Bible itself doesn't claim to be inspired. Nowhere in scripture does a book say, hi, I'm the book of Malachi and I'm inspired. Not one book in here claims to be inspired. No book in the Bible gives a list of all of the other books that are inspired. Nowhere does it say any of this. So, how do we know that this book is inspired, These, this collection of books is inspired? We know because the church that compiled it, the Catholic church that compiled this, knows that uh, and announces these are the inspired books. This is the canon of scripture. That's how we know this. So. Since the Catholic Church is the giver of sacred scripture, the compiler and presenter to the world of sacred scripture, the uh, Catholic Church is also the interpreter of sacred scripture and nobody else. It can't be that way. If the church wasn't interpreting scripture when it was compiling the New Testament and the Old Testament, if it wasn't interpreting scripture then, how would it have known that this book is inspired and this one isn't. We have in our Bible, obviously, as everybody knows, four Gospels. There were 27 Gospels at the time these four were written. These four were determined to be inspired. The other 23 were rejected. Why? Because the same church that compiled them is the same church that interpreted them and understood this is what this means. This is what this means. 
This book is inspired because it goes along with the entire oral tradition that we already have. This is a sum up of what we believe. It is accurate, it's true, etc. You cannot divorce that the Catholic Church compiled the scripture and divorce that from and the Catholic Church is also the sole authoritative interpreter of scripture. The very means that it uh, used and employed to, in, to compile scripture is the same means it used to interpret scripture and still does. This brings us to quite a fascinating uh, arrival then uh, at the point of when we are talking about the incarnation of our blessed Lord and we see that uh, realized in church teaching, how do we know what something means? Which lines of scripture are we supposed to pay attention to? Which ones are our guide? Specifically with regard to uh, uh, the incarnation and the flesh and the human nature of Jesus. When you go to John chapter 6, the last half of the chapter, the, uh, what the, is usually headlined or subtitled uh, the um, bread of life discourse, Jesus says something very, very flat out plainly. He puts his entire reputation on the line with the Jews who are following him by the thousands, by the thousands. The day before, he uh, has the multiplication of the loaves, and it says he fed 5,000, 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So here's a vast throng, and Jesus steps up the next day and puts his entire reputation on the line, and he says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. And it says the Jews began murmuring amongst themselves. What does he mean by that? Da, 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 da. Eventually they come to the pass. They say this is too hard a saying to accept. And many of those who followed him no longer walked with him. John makes that point in the sixth chapter, and nowhere else in the Gospels do you see people getting up and walking away. This becomes the decisive teaching of Christ that drives the wedge between people who will accept Christ in the fullness of his incarnation and those who will reject him. We also hear Jesus say, he who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now the Jews leave. Many of the Jews leave. And Jesus doesn't correct them. He doesn't go to them and say, oh, you misunderstood all that symbolic language. Oh, I'm referencing something Moses said as some symbolic thing. He lets them walk away. He doesn't say, he makes up no excuses for what he said, and they leave. And to underscore the point, he turns around to his 12 apostles and he says, are you going to leave too? And they all say, or Peter says for them, uh, no Lord, to whom, would she go, who, to whom would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. And Jesus says, yes. Da, da. And then he makes a point and says, uh, one of you who does not believe this, one of you is a devil. He's talking about Judas. Where does Judas begin his betrayal of Christ? At the announcement of the Eucharist. He will not believe it. And from that moment, his heart is turned and he betrays Christ in his heart. And eventually, as we all know, what, what is uh, growing in your heart eventually comes out in your actions. It just took Judas an, an appropriate amount of time and the circumstances. But he was corrupted because he refused to believe the teaching of Christ on the Eucharist. The Catholic Church presents to the world this one truth that Jesus Christ is physically present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, really, truly, and substantially under the appearance of bread and wine. That becomes the definition of what it is to be a Catholic. Do you accept this or do you not? This is the, this is the whole point revolving around the entire Protestant Reformation. What defines or separates Catholics from Protestants is the belief in that, nothing else. Everything else is window dressing. Purgatory, the Blessed Mothers, praying to saints, this, all of that stuff is window dressing compared to this one issue. 
Do you accept Christ's words that you must eat his body and drink his blood to have life within you? And if you do not, you have no life within you. Do you accept it? Yes or no? And this is the definition of what it is to be Catholic. Every single thing that flows from the church uh, flows from this one central core teaching, which is precisely, I'm sure when Jesus said things to the Jews about, oh, you know, you shouldn't commit, a, they don't commit adultery, you shouldn't be divorced. I'm sure some people standing on the edges, oh, I don't like that, and they walked away. But nowhere do any of the evangelists make a comment that that's the teaching they walked away from. They walked away from divorce. They walked away from adultery. They walked away from whatever, drinking, carrying. I'm sure when he said all these things, lots of people were sitting on the peripheries going, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I like my drink, so I'm leaving. Why does the Holy Spirit, through the evangelists, make this teaching, make a point that's saying it was when he uttered this teaching that many of his followers abandoned him? Because this is the central teaching of what it is to be Catholic. So... If you are not Catholic or you are a bad Catholic and you refuse to accept this on its face value, where does that leave you? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Now it's curious that one of the expressions Jesus uses uh, oftentimes when he talks is, Amen, Amen, I say to you. Or truly, truly, sometimes it gets uh, translated as. The reason Jesus says, amen, amen, or truly, truly, or sometimes, and I think, I believe the King James Version has verily, verily, it's all the same thing. The reason Jesus uses that expression is because in Jewish law, when you were giving testimony, when you were giving testimony, two witnesses were required for your testimony to be accepted. So Jesus, using himself as his witness to his own truth, says, amen, amen, I say to you. When he presents something in that form, it is God speaking and swearing an oath on himself that everything he says after this point is absolutely true. You will not see him saying, amen, amen, I say to you, there was once a Samaritan going to, no. When he tells parables, he never introduces parables that way. Never in the scriptures will you find him introducing a parable with amen, amen. He'll introduce the teaching or the principle or the point of the story of the parable with amen, amen, I say to you. But he never says it unless, he's make, unless what immediately follows after it is <laughs> the God's honest truth in the real sense of the word. So what is the point of the Eucharist? The point of the Eucharist is to bring us back to the moment of our salvation, the whole point of, the, uh, of our redemption. The whole point of, um, of the conference today is to talk about uh, the incarnation, Jesus in the flesh. That... That Christ, that the second person of the Blessed Trinity chose to make the world in the way he made it is a very interesting point. Because what it does is it underscores that since he set his feet on this path, so to speak, then he locked in his own actions. Didn't have to choose this path for creation. He didn't have to make us with flesh. But he did, and once he did, he locks himself in. He, lo he has locked himself in by his promises to us. God could, he could not follow through on his promises, but that would be going against his nature. So he won't. So when God makes a promise, he finishes the promise. So what did he do when he accomplished his, uh, uh, his act of creation? What did he do when he bound himself to man? In the flesh, in the flesh, our flesh, when Adam and Eve sinned, their souls, before they sinned, their souls were full of all the preternatural gifts, the large one being immortality. And their souls transmitted life to the body, much like a nuclear reactor transmits its energy to the body, to the flesh. So we sin. And what happens? The soul becomes the harbinger of death, and it begins to transmit death to the flesh. And so we hear in the Old Testament, the wages of sin is death. And as death is being transmitted to us, we begin to die. Christ needed to save us, therefore, not only in the soul, but also in the flesh, because we are body and soul. 
And this union of body and soul, the material and the immaterial, the corporeal and the spiritual, this union is something that, that many and most of the Protestant denominations, particularly Calvin and his, that whole ilk, miss. They miss the nitty-gritty, the earthiness of the, sacramentology, uh, of the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Christ saves the world, redeems the world through matter, through the material. This has always been understood in the church, all the way back to the apostles, which is why Paul says of the Eucharist in, in his letter to the Corinthians, he who eats the body and he, he who eats the bread and drinks the cup unworthily is guilty of the death of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because it is Jesus Christ. There isn't a line in Scripture that even begins to suggest that the Eucharist is symbolic. There isn't a line in the interpretation of Scripture anywhere that begins to even hint that this is symbolic. Everywhere, absolutely everywhere, in sacred tradition and sacred scripture, there isn't even a question. It is Jesus Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is what Luther objected to. Luther objected to this, and he objected to the priesthood. The priesthood is how the Eucharist comes about. It's how the transubstantiation comes about. And if this uh, Luther wanted to do away with the priesthood, and go to the priesthood of, of the faithful. And in so doing, he obliterated the Eucharist as well. This is why today, 500 years later, Protestants, the, the definition of a Protestant is one who rejects the Eucharist. That's what it is. You can go on about all these different things, but what is the core holding of the Catholic Church? That that which appears to be bread and wine is actually the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said it in Corinthians. John says it, quoting our Lord in his own gospel in chapter 6. Our blessed Lord himself says it in all three narrative accounts of the Last Supper in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is my body. This is the cup of my blood. Why is this necessary? Only two times in all of Scripture do we hear about a new covenant. The first time we hear about a new covenant is in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. God tells Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, and I showed myself their master, says the Lord. That is the only time in Scripture that God the Father refers to the new covenant. You never see the phrase the new covenant appear again on any page of Scripture, except when you come to the second person of the Blessed Trinity, sitting there incarnate at the Last Supper, when he takes the cup and says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. And there it is, it's fulfilled. Why is that so important? Because if you go back and you look at Malachi, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, verse 10, starting with verse 10, the priests are offering sacrifice. The Jewish priests are offering sacrifice to, uh, uh, to God. And they are taking all of the horrible animals, the lame, the blind, the crippled, the old, the blemished, all of the ones that God had said, you know, you're to give me an unblemished lamb. And, uh, the Jewish priests are keeping the good animals for themselves, and they're getting rid of the horrible animals and the sick and lame and blind and all of that and sacrificing them. Why? So they can profit off the good ones, sell them and make money off them. God becomes irritated and, and explosively angry at this because they're breaking the covenant. The priests are breaking the covenant. So what does he say to them? He says, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire upon my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name is great among the Gentiles, says the Lord of hosts. That's the prophecy of what? Of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Where in 
all of the history of the world is there a pure offering made to God by the Gentiles. A pure offering. What is something that's pure? What can you offer to God that is pure? Ourselves? Certainly not. Fruits, vegetables, bulls, oxen. We already heard from we hear from Paul later on that you know the blood of ox don't the blood, the blood of bulls doesn't remit sins. What can you offer to God that is pure? You can only offer God himself. So our blessed Lord makes himself available through the Eucharist to be continually offered to the Father in an unbloody sacrifice of his act of redemption here. What religion anywhere in the world, among the Gentiles, remember, makes a point of saying the Gentiles, Holy Spirit echoes the words of God the Father in the book of Malachi, where in the world does this offering happen? It happens nowhere except in the Catholic Mass. Now let's shift gears to the aspect of flesh, incarnation. Jesus Christ redeemed us in the flesh. He redeemed souls in the flesh. He also, at the end of time, will redeem our bodies. For the moment, for the moment, our bodies, and except with exceptional cases of the incorruptibles and things like that, but 99.9999% of us go into the ground and rot. And we become the buffet for the worms. Some people will be more of a buffet for the worms than others, but we will all be buffet for the worms. God restores this. God the Father restores this. Why? Why does he restore this to us? Because we are flesh and soul, and he redeems the person. Not the soul, he redeems the person. And this is why he says in the Gospel of Matthew, the sea will give up its dead, and all of creation will stand before God. We will be there with our bodies again. Paul tells us that in a letter to the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians are all terrified and worried because very early on in the church, the first, you know, five, ten years, everybody was kind of expecting Jesus was coming back and then, you know, Monday or, you know, next Thursday at four o'clock or something. Another holdover that seems to still be somewhat prevalent in many faiths today. Um, so he's, they're all thinking, all of a sudden, some of them start dying just of, you know, old age and natural causes. And they're dying, and all the Thessalonians are starting to become upset. And they're like, what's going on? Well, wait, wait, Grandma's dead, Uncle Bob's dead, you know, Aunt Sue's dead, what's going on? And, uh, and Paul sends them a very comforting letter. In his comforting letter, uh, chapters 2 and 3 of the first letter of Thessalonians, spells out, and he says, don't worry, when the trumpet blows and the angels uh, gather everybody, all of the people who, are, who have fallen asleep first will be raised up, and they will go and we will follow them into the air to meet the Lord. You get your bodies back. This is the last line of the creed. In the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, amen. That's what this means. You get this back. So don't mess this up too much. If you smoke, stop. Um, get your flesh back. So it's significant that this happens, that Christ redeems us in the flesh as well as the spirit. Because that's who we are as, hu as humans. We are body and soul. We are this composite of body and soul so tightly wound that death is fearful to us. Our souls know that uh, their existence is bound intricately with the body. And when the body goes away and dies and the soul goes off on its own, it's a fearful, horrible thing. Because the soul knows no existence without its body. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to be. Even the saints in heaven right now are in sort of an artificial state of existence. They are, their, their joy in heaven is not diminished, but they look forward to the day when their bodies, and, where they are reunited with their bodies so that their capacity for joy will be complete. Christ saves us in the flesh, which is precisely why he gives us his flesh now. What does he say in that Gospel of John? He who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, part one, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Eucharist is intimately tied to the resurrection of the dead. Why? 
because when you eat the body and drink the blood of our blessed Lord, your body is given the gift of incorruptibility. Your flesh is given the gift of immortality that will be realized for eternity. That's the point. So rightly does Jesus say, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Well, what life is he talking about? We're people who don't go to Holy Communion now. They're alive, obviously. What life is he talking about? You do not have the life of immortality within you. You cannot be saved. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. The church has never understood those words in any other way. There is no compromise in those words. The Catholic Church teaches things in a very precise fashion, a very black and white fashion. The gray and the theological chatter comes about in trying to give, to put a vocabulary to the eternal truths of God. But the eternal truths of God are very black and white. There is a heaven, there is a hell. God exists. It is not the case that he does not exist. Our eternal destinies are to be with him. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the call of love. This is why, this is why God associates himself with us in the flesh because there is no other way he could love us more. There is no other way he could love us more. He does not save us just spiritually, which is the great farce of people who sit around and say, oh, I believe in the Lord Jesus and that's all I need to do. No, that is not all you need to do. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Explain those words if you think they mean something else. And remember, you're going to have a very difficult time explaining those words when the very contemporaries of his day understood exactly what he meant. It says in John's Gospel, they turned to each other and they said, what does this man mean we should eat his flesh? This is a hard saying. We can't accept this. And they got up and they walked away. They knew precisely what Jesus meant by that statement, and they left, and Jesus let them go. It was true 2,000 years ago, it's been true the 2,000 uh, preceding years, and it's true today, and if we're still around 2,000 years from now, it'll be true then also. There has never been a question in the entire history of the church about what Jesus meant by these words, that he was truly substantially present, uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And my Father and I will come to you, and we will make our home with you, and we will live with you. How does the Father get inside us? Through a, you know, a good, happy feeling? Well, I suppose as an act of grace, every now and then Jesus lets you feel that kind of little surge of you know, emotion or feeling, or you get the, you know, pins and needles, he's up and down you or something. But that's all emotion. How does the Father come to live with you? How does the church define what the Eucharist is? It is really, truly, and substantially the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Divinity. Is Christ's divinity ever separated from the Father or the Son, a Father or the Spirit? No, of course it isn't. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. What's the primary commandment? He who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. You want to be with Jesus? You eat his body and you drink his blood because he commands us to. And if you don't, there's the consequence of Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. It's all pretty straightforward. It's not an awful lot of wiggle room here. As the Jews of Jesus' day understood, they didn't sit around and say, oh, he means something else. They just took off. I don't want to accept this, and they took off. So when you consume 
Jesus in Holy Communion. Remember, you become what you eat. You become what you eat. And what is the nature, what is the, uh, the uh, in philosophy they use the word telos, T-E-L-O-S. It means the end, the goal to which the nature of a thing strives. The nature of humanity is to be immortal. That's how we were made in the garden. We fell. That's what this redemptive act of our Lord on the cross does for us. And it restores to us the possibility that if we choose and act accordingly, we will be restored to that gift of immortality. It is human nature to be immortal. How do you achieve that immortality? By imbibing the blood and eating the flesh of the immortal one. That's how we become immortal. And Jesus makes it very clear. And I will raise you up on the last day. Catholic teaching never allows for any kind of uh, wiggle room. Why? Because ultimately, what is the church about? The church is the body of Christ on earth. That's what it is. And uh, Jesus himself associates himself so closely and so dearly with the church that when, he, when Paul falls to the, Saul falls to the ground on the way to Damascus, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul says, well, who, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, it is I, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Jesus has already been up in heaven on the ascension for two or three years at this point. What's he talking about? Paul's going off hauling some Christians in from Damascus to haul them back in chains to Jerusalem to put them on trial and have them stoned to death like he did Stephen. What's Jesus talking about? So closely and intimately is Christ associated with his church that it actually is him on earth. Why? Because he loves us so much. And it is at the Last Supper in John, John chapter 14, that Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come back to you. Not 2,000 years from now, not sometime at the end of the world, not some 5,000 years later, now. I will come back to you. He comes back to us in the flesh. He never left. He never left in the Eucharist. He left for those three days and came back and has never left. It's interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples don't get anything. What, what did Jesus do when he came back in the flesh to them after the resurrection? He joins them and starts talking to them, asking them questions on the road to Emmaus. And he says, um, so what are you all miserable about here? You two, you're, you're all down in the dumps. What's, what's wrong with you? Sourpuss faces, what's the problem? Like, oh, well, this Jesus, and we thought he was going to be the one, and he's not. And Jesus, well, what are you talking about? Tell me some more. They start to tell him. And Jesus says to them, interestingly enough, he says to them, he calls them stupid. He calls them dense. How dull of mind you are. That's what he says to them. Look it up. I don't make this stuff up. Just repeat it. How dull of mind you are. And if somebody walks up to you and says, hey, you're pretty dull of mind, I think you'd be insulted, right? That's the point. And so what does he say? Jesus does the two essential aspects of Mass. On the road to Amos, he it says he broke open the Scriptures and explained how everything in the Scriptures related to him and how the Son of Man must suffer so as to enter into his glory. What's that? That's the liturgy of the Word. Exp opens them up, reads them all to him. He wrote them so he didn't have to have a book with him. He wrote them, tells them everything. Then what does he do? They sit down. Now encouraged by the faith they hear from the word, the written word, now they sit down and say, well, don't leave us. You know, the, the you know, evening's falling. Stay with us. And what does he do? He performs the liturgy of the Eucharist with them. The question to what did Jesus do when he, what was the first public thing he did when he rose from the dead? He said mass. Why? Because he was the high priest. They race back to Jerusalem because Jesus disappears. He takes the bread, and they say, the Holy Spirit says and through Luke, and, they and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And boom, they hightail out, and, and he vanished from their sight. And they're like, go! <laughs> Flying back down to Emmaus in the dark. Certainly by the time they got to Jerusalem, it was dark. They bust open the door to the upper room. Panting, breathe. <laughs> he said, We've seen the man. They say, Yeah, he appeared to Peter earlier. <laughs> and they tell them what happened. And what was it? It was the Eucharist. 
The Eucharist is what opened their eyes. The very thing that people had walked away for him from is the very thing that brings the core set of believers back. It is the Eucharist. We have seen the Lord. When the church teaches, it teaches in very precise black and white terms because black and white is the nature of love. Nobody wants to be sort of loved. Nobody wants to love sort of. Nobody wants to be kind of known in love. We want to be fully. Now, we may be scared, but ultimately the desire of our heart is to be known and be fully known. That's God's nature for us. That's why he presents himself to us fully, fully. If you don't participate in the humanity of Christ, he's holding something back. He must present us his humanity because that's the nature of love. It's not just looking at Jesus over there going, oh, I can see him with my eyes and there he is. But it's to become absorbed in him in love. In the Eucharist, that's the entire point. What does the word Eucharist mean in Greek? It means thanksgiving. For what? For being accepted into the Godhead. You're no longer slaves. I call you sons because a slave does not know what his master is about. When does he say all of this? At the Last Supper. Everything is revealed at the Last Supper. Everything. I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will lead you to all truth. I have many more things to tell you right now, but you cannot bear them. I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. This is the whole point of the Eucharist. It is Christ present with us. Now, let me throw out a conundrum here. If what looks like bread and wine is not Jesus Christ, then we're all going to hell because we worship bread as God. If, however, because we're idolaters, I believe that's, that bread is Jesus Christ, that what looks like bread is Jesus Christ. I believe that what looks like wine in that cup is Jesus Christ. I commit my life to it, as you all do. If we're wrong, stoke up the flames and get a lot of ice around you when you die. Whole bunch of it. If, however, that is Christ, and his church for 2,000 years has preached it, every line in scripture points to it, our blessed Lord himself says it, he backs it up with miracles on this earth, continuing now even on today, and you do not accept it unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. What happens is I have no idea. I'll leave the Holy Spirit with his words. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. No one comes to the Father except through me. And how does Christ bring himself to the world? Body, blood, soul, and divinity, he brings it through the Eucharist. Unless you receive the Eucharist, you are on very, very thin ice. You may actually be on ice so thin that there is no ice actually under your feet anymore. Particularly if you begin to understand this. Who among all of the Gentiles makes this perfect, pure offering? Nobody except the Catholic Church. Nobody in any Protestant denomination claims that that is Jesus Christ. When our blessed Lord returns on the last day, he will not come back, pardon the expression, he will not come back with one more drop of glory than he possesses right now in the Eucharist. There was a, uh, the only time this ever was really challenged in Catholic circles, the church's teaching on the Eucharist was challenged in Catholic circles, was in the uh, 9th and 10th century. There was a, uh, an abbey uh, French abbey, there's those French again. Uh, there's a French abbey and two monks, one was a superior, one, one was the abbot of the abbey, the other was an underneathman. Uh, the abbot was, uh, uh, the fellow who challenged it was uh, uh, Pasichaeus, who said, this is a symbol of Christ. It's a representation of Christ. But it isn't actually Jesus who was on the cross. 
It isn't actually his same flesh and blood that was born of Mary and laid in the manger and cured people and rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, of the Father in heaven now. It's symbolic. It's a representation. It's not just bread, but it isn't Jesus either. Ah, oh, there's that gray area. Well, then what is it? Then what is it? Never gave an answer to that. The Pope, in uh, about the year 1000, uh, uh, seeing the dangers of denying the truth of the Eucharist, uh, wrote out a confession for uh, Radbertus, who was the guy who was promoting Pasichaeus' stuff, wrote out a confession for Radbertus and said, you will sign this or you are excommunicated. And it was extremely detailed. I believe and do solemnly swear that the bread and wine offered is actual body blood, you know, truly, really substantially, did the whole thing. A thousand years later, a thousand years later, Paul VI used the exact same quote and stuck it into one of his apostolic exhortations. This has always been the case, straight back to Paul. It is Jesus Christ. You are committing the murder of the Lord if you do not receive this worthily. How on earth could you be committing the murder of God, of Jesus? How could you be committing deicide if what you're eating is just glorified wonder bread? It's not possible. It's not possible. Everything in Scripture points to this. Old Testament, New Testament. How could a cup of wine, going back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, how could a cup of wine, if that's all it was, and some Protestants don't even say it was wine. They say it's grape juice. They ran up to the Welch's container, poured it in the cup, and said, here. How could it be anything other than the blood of Christ himself if it is the new and everlasting covenant? God the Father says it once in the Old Testament. God the Son says it once in the New Testament. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Boom, there it is. The prophecy from 700 years earlier fulfilled, 500 years earlier fulfilled. Done for all time new and everlasting. This moment, right now, here and now, I make you priests. I make you priests, I appoint you bishops, and from here on out, you're it. You are my witnesses to this, to the ends of the earth, through Judea, Samaria, and throughout all the world. This is it. Accept it or reject it. Accept it, try to live according to it, do your best to try to live according to it, stay in a state of grace, present yourself worthily, as worthily as we can through the actions of the Holy Spirit in the sanctification of us and die in a state of grace. And as our blessed Lord says, I will raise you up on the last day. Reject this and you have no life within you. We are flesh. Christ comes to us in his flesh. If he does not come to us in the flesh, He's holding back part of himself from us, and God cannot hold back something of himself. It is against his nature to hold back some of his completeness.